Hey, Sean. Yes, sir. Howard Doss. How you doing? I'm good, man. A little man, hot. A little hot. It is a little hot, man. We're getting into the summer season. We've, uh, we got back from Vegas. We did. Right. Fantastic time out there. Speaking of hot, Vegas is like, I don't know, surface of the sun hot right now? Literally, yes. Well, it is here in Tulsa this weekend, too. It's pretty damn hot. Yeah, that's for sure. But we've had some great guests, and we're glad to be back in the studio because we've got some more great guests here. Always. Uh, our guest today, though, a man... She probably had to go through one of the, and I'm going to use this term right now, biggest media circuses that we have ever seen. Absolutely. I think, in fact, that was probably the biggest, that was the first huge media circus that we went through. At least, I don't want to say in my lifetime. I mean, I think the way the media has changed through the years, this was probably the spot, the, the, the incident that I think that they just became obsessed with. And I don't care if you're nine or you're 90, you, you know about this case. Correct. So this was a this was a big case that happened, and we've never gotten the perspective of the family member. And I can't. I mean, we just got finished going through all the ordeals of like the Amber Heard and the Johnny Depp trial, and we've heard everybody else's opinion, but we haven't heard family members' opinion on what goes on with the crime. So that's what we're gonna have on today. We've got a great guest, and the case that we're talking about is the case of uh, the O.J. Simpson trial. Yes. yes. And, and today we have uh, Kim Goldman on there, whose uh, brother was the one of the center victims of that crime. So she's going to share what it was like to be involved in that media circus and kind of tell us what it what she's done since then. So welcome today, Ms. Goldman. It's good to have you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Pleasure. Where are you coming to us from? Where are you at? I'm in uh, north of Los Angeles, up in the suburbs of LA, north of the Valley. Okay, good. California. Good. Um, I was actually just out in LA last week and uh, I happened to be there it was perfect weather days. I was there for a few days and uh, don't laugh. We went out there. Uh, uh, somebody was going to the Backstreet Boys concert at the Hollywood Bowl. So that's, what we, that's what we made the trip out there <laughs> for. So uh, I did not attend myself, but we made sure everybody that wanted to go got there. Hey, but you know what we like to do on here? Hey, and Kim, we didn't even ask you, what are you drinking today? Since we like to have cocktails on cocktails and cocktails. Okay, uh, well, I missed that. So I might have to ring my bell for my son or my uh, future husband in the house to get me a seven and seven, because that is usually what I put in my cup. But I was trying to be a good girl today and have water, but I, I'm going to put my order in. Put it in, yes. Where, we, so where I, the hell do you get a bell? Yeah, we need a bell here. <laughs> yeah, we don't have oh, a bell. When I, when I turned... Um, 40, my girlfriends gave me a drink bell so I could just cling, <laughs> cling, cling. Yeah. So have you ever heard of that. this? W w Jason just got a new job. Yeah. Jason is going to be <laughs> our drink bell girl. Yes. Or but, yeah, we're going to hire somebody. What are you drinking? It. We're going to drink some, uh, we're going to drink some fantastic. We're going to drink. What do you call these? Purple top. Purple tops. These are like Bigfoots in the bourbon world. And what we're Very drinking, nice. we're drinking an eight year. Will it bourbon, uh, 127.8 proof, uh, time changes everything to the name of it. So every one of these barrels that they do, they go ahead and they put, uh, whoever picks the barrel gets to name it. So that's how oh. this turned out. So this is some fine, this is the finest of the corn liquor out there. And we'll toast to Joan on this one for sure. Yep. Cause definitely. she's, she's been very good to us. Very much so. Cheers. And old Jessica out there Cheers. at Willet Distillery. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. We need another bell. All right. <laughs> I'll mail you one. <laughs> All right, Ms. Goldman. Tell us what it was like to sit in that courtroom while that was going on. Um, you know, it's 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 so it's hard to put into words. It's just um, you know, I ha I have to kind of remind myself that, you know, it was 20 plus years ago when I was a uh, a, a younger version of, of my maturity, my matured self. Um, it was incredibly overwhelming and scary and confusing. Um, you know, I went to court every day and, um, I didn't miss any day of testimony. Um, and so I was balancing trying to be, um, you know, a, a, a pillar of strength for our family and a representative while I was also experiencing immense grief. I was 22, 23 at the time. Um, 
and then just being dumped off into this incredibly invasive, overwhelming experience, um, trying to figure out who killed my brother and, and why it was getting such, um, you know, national attention. So it was just a mixed bag of, um, high intensity emotion. When did you hear the news that your brother had been murdered? Um, on June 13th, um, I was living in San Francisco and I was a, a full-time student at San Francisco State and I was working at Wells Fargo Bank and I was on shift that day. And um, uh, when I got home at 6, 6.30, um, my boyfriend at the time, uh, we were living together and he had he had already received the call from my dad who told him to be prepared um, to support me when I got home. And um, my dad, I called him and, and, uh, cause he was asking for me to call and, uh, he had asked me if I'd seen any ghosts. Oh, geez, I'm so sorry. Um, he had asked me if I'd seen any coverage, um, on the news, uh, that day. And, uh, I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, and he said, you know, do you know, Nicole Brown Simpson? I like, what are you, do you know, OJ Simpson? I'm like, why are you asking me these ridiculous questions? And then he just blurted out that my, my, they found my brother dead alongside Nicole. And these were 20 years ago. This was pre-iPhone, right? We're on iPhone 13, so it's 13 years old This, this was, what, 28 years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be, yeah, uh, 94. So this was this was the days of the of the brick cell phone that, you know, we almost carried around in the little suitcases. This was, right. you know, pager, beeper days. Um, so in my apartment in San Francisco, we had one landline um, in our house. Um, so this was, yeah, pre pre-everything. Uh, couple, for a couple news stations and that's it for all of our listeners out there that are younger than like 35 a landline is a phone that was in your house that was hooked to a cable <laughs> and, and it had a cord and depending on how cool your parent was was the length of the cord right some of them you had to stay within about three feet of the wall right and, and other you had ones, like a good 25 footer you could stretch from the kitchen to the living room for a little privacy or the bathroom or the, uh, I, I don't take phone calls in the bathroom myself <laughs> i didn't still take, to this day i don't well i wasn't using the bathroom i was just kind of it was a good. I used to get yelled at when I would stretch the cord out because I wanted privacy, oh, yeah. and then my dad would come in and the and our co perfectly coiled phone was all stretched out and and you know because I would use my fingers and twirl it and yeah. Oh, so. same. Oh, yeah. You yeah. You or a pin. You'd run a pin uh -huh. through it. I'd do that a lot. Also, <laughs> I remember actually. I know we're kind of getting off topic, but we when I was that. in high school, uh, just because you know being a teenage kid, and I actually lived out in the Bay Area myself, and. Uh, I worked just one of the things I was saving for a car, but I also paid for my own phone line for my bedroom. So I had a phone I line in my bedroom. Well, I got a quick story. We're going to go way off topic now. How but, in the hell did you do that? Well, do you because, remember your first phone number? That I don't. That I, I, I know don't. my, I know mine. Right, right, put it out there. Let's call it and find who has it right now. 634-1818. Is that area code 415? I don't remember the area code because okay. I was, well, probably 312. I was in Chicago, but I remember 634-1818. My very right. first phone number. Mm -hmm. Five, two, one, two, five, seven, eight. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. No, but so w when I had mine, I'm just for all you younger listeners, I'm giving you an idea here. <laughs> um, in my, I had a semester in school where I liked to skip school in high school and I would show up every morning. I'd get up, go to school, and then we'd all kind of skip out for the day. And so there was like the automated system where the school would call, you know, hey, your son or daughter has missed one or more periods today. One of those type of deals. Well, I had a friend of mine that worked in the office as like an office aide. And so we had changed it from the home phone number to my bedroom phone. So my parents never knew I was missing school. Uh, and this went on for quite a while during one semester. And then my French teacher had my mom's work number. Oh, and shit. called my mom at work. And then that's when they found out the number of days, how much I missed. And needless to say, my phone line disappeared, but I enjoyed it while I had it. So huh. very nice. And I love the little French reference. I yes, took French. I did. That was unusual back then. Mm -hmm. It was. Well, I, I mean, I, I I knew I was going to the law enforcement. I should have taken Spanish, obviously. Uh, but, you know, I, I thought it was like a romantic language and it would help out <laughs> with ladies. He's, and, he's sensitive like that. Yeah. It, yeah. Wee, wee, mm -hmm. wee. Wee, wee. Wee, wee. Wee, wee. Je ne suis pas. So you so. went through all of this. I mean, and I, it's hard for people to understand that they don't have instantaneous information right in their hand. Like, carrying around yeah. these small com little computers that we can find any information out at any given time. So you get this call, your dad tells you, um, I'm sure that you immediately go down to be with your family. Yeah. I mean, I, 
you know, I was living in San Francisco. It's like a 45, 50 minute flight. Um, I, I, I was panicked. I had no idea what was going on. We had very little information at the time. Um, it was not on our newscast. Well, I shouldn't say that. My brother's face was not on our newscast yet. Um, in San Francisco. Um, uh, so I couldn't find anything immediately. Um, but I wasn't trying to find it on the news. I was just hurrying up to pack, um, to get on our flight. And we raced, um, to Oakland to get on the, on the flight out of Oakland cause it was quicker and, and, uh, the first one available. And I just was a complete mess on the plane. I remember specifically, um, the flight attendant, um, you know, staring at me because I was just, I was sobbing and, um, I just, she was very worried about me. I remember that. Um, and then we got off the, uh, the air, the airplane and, you know, again, that was pre nine 11. So you were allowed to, you know, meet your, your family at the gate and, and smoke um, on the plane. And sm- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I was, it was one of the last flights. It wasn't very full. I remember getting off and I remember seeing my dad at the end of the, the walkway, um, where you greet your family. And, um, I just remember falling into his arms and just completely collapsing. Um, because I just, I, I'd never lost anybody before. And so, you know, it was just completely jarring to hear that it was my brother who was the closest thing to me, uh, you know, outside of my dad. And, um, you know, you just, when you, when you hear that someone died, you know, usually you think car accident or, you know, some kind of natural, you know, causes. Um, but, we didn't know what had happened. There were rumors, I should say rumors in that first day that it was, you know, um, that he, that they were gunshots. I mean, we just didn't had no information. So we were very much in the dark in those first, um, first day or two. Um, and then, and then it caught on like wildfire. You know, is, is that pretty normal that you kind of, what information you kind of have, the police have, they kind of hold it back a little bit and yeah, you know, and, and just as we're talking, you know, 28 years ago, media compared to now is definitely a little bit, I mean, it's very different. You know, now police departments themselves obviously have social media and, and you know, everybody's not only really demanding, they expect information from the police departments on things that are happening. And so police departments, you know, using the, the word transparency, they try to put things out, you know, oftentimes, hey, we're we're investigating a homicide over here at this location. You know, they'll, they'll, even just something as generic as that, they try to get it out. Um, but you know, there are parts of an investigation, obviously that the police, if they don't want the public to know at times, and as tough as it is, they don't even want to share it with the family because it's, they're, they're hoping it doesn't interfere with their investigation or a suspect they're trying to track down, you know, and things like that. So they have to hold a lot of things, you know, close to the chest. Gotcha. Right. Because if they really, if they reveal all of the facts, then everybody has them. And so the real killer wouldn't they, you want the real killer to be able to have facts that otherwise other people don't kind of a thing, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. want to jeopardize the investigation. Uh, absolutely. Ideally, you would like to be able to identify who a suspect is after you've spoken with win, uh, witnesses or you've got some, you know, whether it's forensic evidence, um, you know, ballistic evidence, whatever it may be, you want to be able to sit down with a suspect and him basically not have had time knowing what you know already to prepare his defense to you face to face. That's why that right. first interview is so important. Well, from the time yeah, I he- think... No, go ahead. No, I was I was just going to say, you know, I think I, something that that stands out to me as as being incredibly upsetting at the time was that we, you know, when you watch television, um, you know, the 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 police shows and law enforcement, you know, legal shows or whatever, always there's a knock at the door, right? And it's mm-hmm. we're you know sad to inform you that so and so we didn't we didn't get that. We had no knock at the door. We had no phone call from anyone in the police department. Um, it was the coroner's office that called us um, to let us know. And quite frankly, it was all day that they were trying to get a hold of somebody in our family because they didn't release my brother's name until they made the first notification, which That's, I appreciate. Yep. Um, and that actually, I know this because Deborah Tate is a friend of mine, um, that that piece of uh that notification system was because of how uh, Sharon Tate's murder was um, shared with the world before Deborah Tate's family knew. Anyway, off track. Um, so anyway, we had the, the coroner's office call and um, talked to my stepmom. My dad wasn't even home. And um, she started to relay the information to my stepmom, who was completely confused as to what was happening. And then my dad, lo and behold, was walking through the door as my stepmom Patty was yelling, Fred, Fred, there's something wrong. You need to pick up the phone. Something happened to Ron. And my dad picked up. They were both on the landlines. Um, and 
Claudia Radcliffe, uh, the coroner, she was the one that said, um, you know, Ron had, they found my brother and um, they found his ID, his driver's license. Um, and that's how they knew it was him. But they, we had random phone calls left on our voice, ma on our voice machine all day long from people that were trying to see if we were home. Um, and it was bizarre because we were getting these weird calls and um, people that my brother knew and friends uh, that were wanting to know if he was home. And then my stepmom was thinking, why are you calling my house? Ron doesn't live here. And so it was all a kind of a setup to just, just strange. It's little things. And, and this, I mean, I, I can't even not exaggerating within 30 seconds of the coroner and my dad hanging up, my brother's face was plastered all over the news. Hmm. Ma'am, I'm sorry. I know that I, I know that you probably have talked to this about this and I'm sure that even talking to us now, none of the pain has really gone away. I've known that I've lost people when they were young and you just always a hole there that you have. So we really appreciate you talking to us about it. So from the time that you got this information to the time that let's call it the media circus started or the trial started, how long was that? Well, those are two different things. The media circus started pretty immediately when we were, you know, hounded by the the journalists and press and phone calls and, you know, from within a couple of days, our street was lined with media trucks and we were followed and um, it was everywhere. Um, uh, so I would say the media circus was pretty quick being that the uh, number one suspect was who he was. Um, but the trial, you know, it, happened fairly quickly. I don't really know what a standard time frame is for a trial, but it happened fairly quickly within a year. Um, and then it was just, you know, they, they called it the, the, um, you know, camp OJ, um, at the, at the courthouse. Um, and there was just, you know, hordes of, of platforms for media to sit. Um, and it was just cameras everywhere, microphones everywhere, you know, um, journalists running around notepad. I mean, it's just, I mean, you've seen the images of it, um, but I don't think it does it justice as to how, how incredibly invasive and overwhelming, um, that, that was it, but it just, it was nonstop for a couple of years for sure. So you were 22 years old. You're basically being stalked by the media. Mm -hmm. Did you have to quit your job at Wells Fargo? Did you go back to I did. school? I, I did. I, I went back, um, I went back for a short period of time and then realized I couldn't, I couldn't stay. Um, it was too hard for me to be away and court was happening, you know, grand jury testament, you know, grand jury. And, um, I wanted to be close to home and I just, I felt obviously very quickly, very isolated in San Francisco. And I made the very difficult decision to leave school. I had, you know, half a semester left. I was, you know, uh, applying for my master's program and, uh, I just, packed up and grabbed my cat and a suitcase and, and moved home and moved into my, my dead brother's room. Jeez. Kid, yeah. That's kind of tough. That's yeah. Just, sorry. Don't know well, else I to appreciate say to that. that one, you know, you I know? just, it, it's, it's, you know, my brother and I very close and um, you know, we always made a promise that would be, we would be there for each other no matter what. And so there was nowhere else for me to be other than in court every day, um, being, you know, a representative of him. And, you know, I, I wanted the killer. I, th in very early on, I did not believe that, that who was acquitted was actually the person that I felt committed the crime. Um, I was still kind of reserving judgment until later on, but I wanted him and people to know that my brother had a family. My brother was very quickly dismissed in the very early um, year of this. And, you know, that was upsetting. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that people knew that he had a family that loved him and adored him and, you know, that we're going to be by his side till the very end. Well, and Kim, just like you said, you know, that the guy that obviously was acquitted and, you know, I mean, he became the focal point of this when he was the suspect and it, it yeah. does, it dismisses the victims uh, of the crime. And, you know, because of that, I know you yourself, you know, like I said here, you know, 25 plus years later, you have, uh, you know, advocated basically to help the victims of crime. And I don't know if necessarily the word is rights, but just you, you've been part of organizations and things like that to kind of try to help people um, work their, their way through these type of things and support the victims and the victims' families. Yeah. And I, I, 
I feel I talk about it a lot. I talk about it on, you know, in the in the things I've done publicly in books or whatever, that it's 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 a burden and it's a gift. And I have to be first and foremost being able to put myself in a position that I feel strong enough and vulnerable enough um, and committed enough to keep putting myself out there because it's it's hard. It's hard to and it's not reliving because it's it's always with me. It's just, you know, sometimes I bring it more into the focus and sometimes I let it sit sit back and rest a little bit. So when I choose to be outspoken about victims' issues and survivor issues and, you know, the impact of media or law enforcement, you know, I just have to kind of bring it back up and be like, okay, today's the day. I got to psych myself out. There's a bigger message here, a bigger purpose. And then I need to figure out a way to self-care and go back to taking care of myself and my son and my family and um, but I, I can't not do it, um, because there is such a tremendous need and, you know, because our family's case was so high profile, I feel, um, an intense need to just keep talking about things because there's a platform and not every family gets that. And that's horrible. And so, um, our, our case, our loss isn't any greater than anybody else's because it was on television. But if we have the platform, it's an opportunity for us to try to bring things to the light that don't often get to be there. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, I, I guess what's the hardest thing about that. And, and I mean, obviously you and I don't know one another, but I was a police officer for 25 years and just retired and, you know, been a part of numerous, uh, you know, homicide cases and testifying and, and, and things like that. And there's people who I have 100% felt were guilty of, you know, the, the accused crime and were found not guilty. Um, and obviously with this one, you know, with your brother, this thing being on the platform, it was what's so difficult And for any of the listeners, whether you think, you know, OJ did it or not, it, it, again, it goes back to taking away from the victims, you know, uh, you know, know, your, your brother and Nicole, because it was, there were people that were just celebrating, cheering in the streets that he was not guilty. But if he's not, you know, if he's in fact, not the person that did it, not saying he's not guilty. If he's in fact, not the person that did it, you still have two victims that there's no justice for. And that just got completely lost in the, we keep yeah. using the word, the media circuit just got lost in the media circus and the, and the people that, you know, just, uh, were enthralled with it. You know, but, but thank you for saying that. Um, to that point though, when we talk about the difference between media then versus now, there's a whole new generation of, of viewers and listeners um, that know about the case and study the case and have opinions now about the case who also now have access to me and our family and other victims, you know, um, that have no tact necessarily when 100%. sharing their hundred <laughs> percent. No, hundred percent. So it is now to this point, like, okay, well you can, you can think that he didn't do it, but my brother was still stabbed to death and I'm still without a family member. So you can think he didn't do it, but why do you hate me so much? Like why I get tons of hate mail. Yep. Um, and why like, I, I still have a loss just because I believe someone did it that you don't doesn't take away from the loss and what my brother and Nicole endured that that night. And that's the part that is really hard for me to reconcile. Um, it's, it's sort of this, you know, people are, my feeling is people are desensitized a little bit because we have so much crime and trauma that it is really hard to remind yourself that there is a person attached to the story and, um, you know, lives are lost and there's grief. Well, yeah. And kind of just following up on that thought. I mean, nowadays, you know, when you've got an open case, um, where yeah. somebody hasn't been charged and just like you're referring to these, you know, couch sleuths or whatever it is, the people, you know, whether they think they're doing good by their, their, stuff, but they come up with a lot of wild conspiracy theories and they really do. And it's shared on, you know, Reddit or internet or their YouTube channels or whatever it is. And so it, it, I'm telling you as a police officer, it oftentimes can interfere with the case, you know, with what's really going on or, you know, where the case is really going because these people at home who have never interviewed a real person in their life, uh, you know, are talking shit. Literally, that's it. They spur things off. I mean, we see it in all, you know, I mean, gosh, you see it in politics, you see it in people criticizing law enforcement and so forth, but yeah. Well, it, and it's then you end up chasing leads exactly. and you end up chasing leads that may or may not pan out to anything as opposed to the ones that are actually legitimate because you are in a situation that you can't leave any stone unturned. Right. And so if you have all of these people out there throwing shit against the wall, you have to see what sticks and what doesn't, but you have to handle every piece of shit. And so 
you know, I, I worry about that. I mean, you know, we haven't talked about it much, but yet, but with my podcast, that's part of why I wanted to do it is to really kind of share with people the, the ins and outs of this, the stuff that they don't really understand, um, the impact of some of those, you know, web sleuths and conspiracy theories and all that stuff that really can kind of derail, uh, you know, the legal and the, in, uh, the investigative process. One of the things that we like to do on this podcast is we like to humanize everybody, right? We like to, we, everybody's got a story to tell. The big thing that I see with you is 22 years old. I've got a couple of daughters. He's got a daughter. They were about your age when this happened. So yeah. I immediately empathize yeah. with that. The big thing that I'm seeing from you that I'm curious about is how did you develop stress resilience? Because you, you were, you were under a tremendous amount of stress and it sounds like you're still under stress from this thing that happened dang near three decades ago. You know, I thank you for asking that. Um, that doesn't usually get discussed. Um, I didn't handle it very well in the beginning. Um, I, re I remember vividly the day that my dad pinned me down and forced me to take a Valium because I was completely out of my mind and I wasn't sleeping and I was a hot mess. Um, I lost, I'm already, a fairly petite person and I lost a tremendous amount of weight and it wasn't because I wasn't eating. I just couldn't, couldn't keep anything on. I wasn't sleeping. Um, my dad and I both have not slept well since that day. It's just body doesn't let me relax completely. Um, but I, I turned to, uh, I had a wonderful therapist early on, um, but support groups, uh, were not entirely available at the time. Um, because our case was so public that there was no place I could go to have some anonymity and privacy. And so I didn't feel safe. Uh, so I retreated, I, um, isolated, uh, surrounded myself with just a hand handful of people, um, that I trusted. And it was a little bit later once all of the trials ended that I really started to kind of embrace my healing and my morning a little bit. Um, and that just included therapy and journaling and writing. Um, I come from a life of uh, psychology. And so I used some of the skills I learned in therapy growing up, but I was a psych major at the time. So those things came in handy. And then I, to be honest with you, I separated myself a little bit so that I could get my footing back um, and then really tried to realign myself with what was important to me. And then I struggle every day, every day. It's a conscious effort to take a deep breath, to put myself first, to get some sunshine on my face, to you know, take a deep breath, um, to exercise, whatever it is. Um, but every day I, I have to choose to, to stay balanced in some, and then I give myself permission to just fall apart also, um, and let that be part of the process. Well, the media really doesn't have many boundaries. I mean, they'll get up in your business. Everybody else will get up in your business. Like you said, it, uh, the way that I kind of equate what you went through is it's like a, watching an MMA fight. You know, everybody's interested. Everybody wants to watch the fight. I want to see, I want to see him get hit and swings and I'll see him break down and all that stuff, but they're not the people actually in there taking the punches. So it's real easy to be a spectator on this. Why do you think well, people go ahead? Sorry. Why do you, why do you think people find this so goddamn fascinating? I, I hate to say, because I think of who he was, uh, is the killer. Um, I think I, I did not understand him to be a celebrity type. I wasn't into football then. I, you know, I wasn't living in Los Angeles. I grew up in Chicago. So I had no, no idea who he was, his, you know, football and fame wise. Um, and I, I don't know if it was because it was the first time it was actually a case like that was televised. I mean, before that, I think the first case was probably the Menendez brothers. Um, oh yeah. That's uh, right. But that really didn't anywhere come close to where our case did. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if it was a beautiful blonde woman and, you know, a, and hey. a handsome brother. Like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm still completely, this is not just, you know, us either. This was, you know, international, we were getting mail from people in the Netherlands and, you know, South Africa, Europe, Italy. I mean, I, so far reaching. Um, and I don't, I don't know. And it still is that, is that way. Um, I don't, I don't know. I'm fascinated by it. Well, two things. First mail is a thing that used to come in a box that we would get from people <laughs> and it mm -hmm. would come to you. That's one. The other thing is, is your brother was beautiful. I sit next oh. to a very ugly man every day and your brother was much better looking than this guy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you know, you. it's funny you say that about mail. We used to get mail sent to our house, Goldman family, Agora, California. 
That's it. No, no zip shit. code. Because there was no ability to search the internet to know what zip codes were. So it yep. just got put in the mail. And I don't know how in the heck it came to us. Um, I have no idea, but I vividly remember mail. Just that's it. There was no other identifying. So how much mail did you, you get? Yes. Oh my gosh. Buckets and buckets of mail. And we read through every single piece. Really? Um, every sing- I, I remember vividly um, when the civil case started, uh, we got, we were opening mail. We had it. We finally at that point had a PO box. Um, there was a piece of mail that came and it was from a, um, it was from a young, I don't know, nine, 10 year old um, who had oh, so sweet. They put a dollar in Aww. the, in, in the, in the envelope with a letter. And they said, we're supporting you and, and we're behind your family here. Hope this helps. And it just, you know, in the face of so much hate that we had received, it was stuff like that, that really just reminded us that we were doing the right thing, that, you know, we had truth on our side and, and that people were connecting with our, our, our focus and that they loved my brother, um, in a way that I was just really fortunate to be able to share. Yeah, you know, if anybody takes the time to write a letter, and, and, and I hope the majority of it was supportive, um, you know, that was coming to you. But, you know, even part of the live PD show, um, the fan mail became a thing. And yeah. it was, it, I don't want to say it was odd to me, but it, it definitely was different. Um, you know, because I'm just like, man, I'm a regular dude that's a cop. And, you know, my police department almost every day is getting fan mail that's showing up there at the, at the department. Um, that they're having to deliver out to my division, but all of it was fantastic. And it, I mean, some of the things that were sent were interested, interesting. I had, uh-huh. I had one, I mean, I'm, yeah, we, you want to tell us? Well, no, no, it was nothing like <laughs> that. But I, I mean, I had a woman that made homemade toothpaste that wanted to Who send toothpaste. Makes, I don't know. Was her I don't name know. Martha Stewart? I don't know. But just when you talk, <laughs> I mean, literally homemade toothpaste. Um, did you use it? I did not. Um, you know, <laughs> nothing against somebody, if I knew making it, you know, I just don't know what was in it, but yes. uh, just going back to even the $1, it actually, it, it, there was somebody who sent, I want to say it was like three or $400 to me, like literally yeah. three or 400 bucks. And it was just, they were like, Hey, just want to let you know, we so, support police. And I put it to a nonprofit. Um, yeah. you know, it wasn't something I kept myself, but it just, you're talking about a kid. There are people out there, even in these, you know, horrific thing, like your family was going through, um, you know, the, the, for me, the police profession kind of just getting, you know, kicked while it's down type of thing. There are yeah. people out there that still support. They just don't get that media uh, love, I guess, is the word for it. media attention. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think it's really helpful. You know, we we are in a, a, a time period now where, you know, the hatred is what's amplified. And so uh, yes. when there are times that we can highlight the alternative, because it's really easy. I mean, and I'm sure you experience this. Um, I only remember that, you know, it's really easy to remember the negative stuff. And so I have to consciously, you know, remind myself of all the positives. So we still have the the letters that's in my dad's garage in Arizona. Um, but not all of them, but a majority of them. Um, because it's really helpful to remind yourself that there's goodness out there. And when, you know, I would imagine in, in your, your line of work, Sean, that you saw so much, despair and, and, you know, ug- ugliness, you know, that you have to have those moments where you can take, a, you know, to be gracious and, and have some gratitude about the impact that you were having. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you this. Uh, you know, you talked about when the notification came, it came from the, the coroner's office and I'm just backtracking a little bit here. What was it like for your family, you know, w- working with the, the, LAPD, you know, the detectives or even the district attorney's office back then, you know, through not just the inv- initial investigation, but up through the trial and post. I mean, you know, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. Very early on, there was, I, I don't have very vivid memories of having conversations. Um, uh, and that isn't to say they didn't happen. I just don't have very vivid ones they, or if they were few and far between. Um, I remember meeting Marsha Clark the first time. Um, mm-hmm. I remember having a call with Tom Lang and Phil Van Adder, who were the lead detectives. Um, but they were just, you know, giving us, you know, brief overview of what to expect um, and and what to prepare for. But again, we weren't given any, pri- we weren't privy to any information. Um, I really liked Marsha Clark when I first met her. She was incredible and I felt very lucky. Uh, Chris Darden, who uh, mm-hmm. became the prosecutor, um, he wasn't the original one. It was Bill Hodgman um, who ended up having a heart attack and had to pull himself off second chair. Um, but 
Chris was a little standoffish in the beginning. And then as the pr trial progressed, those roles switched a little bit and I became much closer with Chris. He and I are very good friends to this day. Um, Marcia became a little bit, um, more standoffish. Uh, she had a lot going on. If people remember, she was being, you know, dragged through the mud as well. Yep. Um, as the trial progressed, I got super close with everybody in the district attorney's office, the investigators, the LAPD. Um, I, I felt like they were the only people fighting for my brother and Nicole. So I took, I really, I supported, I was outspoken. I hated when people were negative and made disparaging comments till this day. I, I'm almost unwilling to see where there were mistakes made. Um, I'm, I, I cop to that because I don't, I don't want to take away from what they were up against. I don't want to take away from um, who the killer was and, and the scrutiny that they were under. Yes, I'm sure mistakes were made, but none of them were grave enough that it was going to change the outcome. I mean, if they had a videotape of the killer doing it, something would have come out that it was, you know, edited. It wasn't him. It's, you know, and so I just feel like they were the people that fought the hardest for my brother, Nicole, and I am forever indebted um, to them. And they all really suffered greatly um, throughout that case and after. So um, the people are close to my heart. I'm nope. sure they got some hate mail too. Yeah, I can only imagine. Yes. And and I just pulled it up right here. Uh, I mean, just in 1994 in LA County, which is who would have prosecuted the case. You know, mm -hmm. keep in mind this is back in the, I mean, literally the height of like, gang violence that was going on, and uh, you know, the West Coast, East Coast, things like that. I mean, that was when it's at its highest point in LA County that year. 1,669 homicides. It's a yeah. lot of people. That's a lot. So, you know, this case, obviously, like I said, I don't want to say rose to the top, but definitely got the most attention. So just the prosecutors out of that office and the number of cases they're working to begin with is overwhelming. And then you have one of this magnitude that the media attention and stuff like that. Well, and it was it's also tough. it was also on the heels of the Rodney King um, police beating story yep. um, in Los Angeles. And um, and I know this is a very small fact, but. Our case, my brother's murder happened in Santa Monica, which um, is a different jurisdiction than where the case was tried in Los Angeles. And so that was a big point of contention back then because we didn't understand why it was being moved um, to downtown LA, which changed the jury pool. And so yep. um, lots of thoughts about that, but it did change the jury pool um, and the reason Gil Garcetti, who was the district attorney at the time, mm -hmm. the reason he said he did it was because, you know, the downtown office could withstand all the media. And I'm thinking, why is that your priority? Like, the, why isn't the case just in the jurisdiction that the that the murder happened? And so in hindsight, I see now why that may have hurt us. But at the time, I thought, OK, I didn't. Oh, this building is bigger. I didn't think anything of it. But there was a lot of um, uh, uh, issues around that decision as well. Sure. Yeah, lawyers think a lot different. Hey, Sean, have you noticed I've had more energy during this podcast? You have today. Uh, you, get, you sleep better last night? No, 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 no. I didn't. I have. Uh, we've got. We've got some good stuff that we're having. I've been drinking this Magic Mind. You have it in the morning with your caffeine. I don't drink coffee because you're you're a, you're a tea drinker. I am. I'll drink some tea in the morning. I might as well be British the way I like the tea. You do like a good tea. I don't put milk in it, but I like a good tea. But this uh, this stuff's helping me, man. It's making me more focused. It's giving me more energy, and uh, it's making me a little bit happier. No, it is. I you know they the the, the folks out of Magic Mind sent that out to us early this week, and I've had it the last couple of days. You know, I'm not, was it matcha? Is that the it's pronounced matcha. matcha? I'm not a, a matcha tea guy generally. I am a coffee guy in the morning. That's it. I'm not one of these all day guys. I rarely drink an energy drink, but I've been giving this a try. And uh, it, first of all, it actually tastes good. I was very surprised. It's like a natural yeah, it's herbal green. thing. It is green. It is green, but uh, I think it's fantastic, man. It tastes great. Well, I was um, with you the first time I had it. I was like, "This, it's two ounces. I'll see what it." Yeah, it's good. It came down. I think it's the honey. It's got a little bit of sugar. I've been on this new diet too, so it's really helpful. It's fifteen calories, and this stuff is a pep in your step. And where can people find Magic Mind? Uh, they can get it online. They can yeah. if you go to MagicMind.com. Uh, you sign up for the subscription, Kim. I hope you're taking notes here. You sign yes. up from the I subscription. I am. I actually that's why I'm doing it on my computer. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. Good. Good answer. Uh, you know, you can get uh, with a subscription like 40 percent off, and I think there's a 20 percent off uh, like one time deal. Use this the the code sticks. That's you. Twenty that's sticks. Twenty. S T I C K S twenty. Yeah. 
So Try give it, it a shot, man. It, honestly, it's good. It, it really is a is. shot. It's two ounces. Yeah, That's it's a, a little shot. shot. So it's, it's kind of take it one in the morning, let it replace your uh, all that caffeine you might get from coffee hey, and help yourself out. Kim, it may help with some stress resilience, too. It is. Hey, <laughs> literally. It, it says listen, it relaxes It you says that. on so right here, that. gives you energy. Second line. Excellent. Help, helps you relax. Aptogens is so what it has. keeps it? you focused and makes you happy. Very good. I, mean, I need what, that. What more could you ask for? Okay. So these interviews fly. I mean, they absolutely fly. But we we really need to get into what you're doing these days. Yeah. What am I doing these days? Um, I am um, I am a parent to a first year college student. He just came home from college. So you know what Venmo is, right? I do. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Or or, or Cash Um, App. (laughs) Cash App. Yes. Ridiculous. Um, so I'm raising my son. I'm, I'm newly engaged and I am. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Um, and, uh, he gave you a, a ring and a bell. He did, right? Yeah, he's actually coming. I just reminded him. Um, so, uh, I, I thought we have to toast. Um, and I am launching a podcast um, aptly called Media Circus, which we've been talking huh. about a little bit here. Yeah, imagine that. Um, I wrote a book a handful of years ago with the same name, um, and I, I interviewed families and survivors from victims and survivors from high-profile cases uh, dating back to the early 1960s and um, wanted to take people kind of behind the scenes where where journalists and cameras leave off and really tell people what goes on when the cameras go away and how people deal with um, their trauma and their grief and their resiliency and and kind of let people into where the the media got it right, got it wrong, um, and to hopefully sensitize people to what the stories are that they're listening to and to remind them that there's humans attached to it. And so my podcast is very similar to that, except it's like this, although we're not doing audio, video, but... Um, so I've I've already been talking with um, families. Uh, George Floyd's family is going to be uh, coming up in a week or two ago. Uh, and Fred Guttenberg, um, uh, his daughter Jamie was killed in Parkland. Judy Shepard, uh, her son Matthew Shepard was one of the uh, yep. worst hate crimes yep. of our time. Um, Kelsey German, uh, her sister Liberty German uh, was killed. It's an unsolved case right now. Is known as the Snapchat murders. Um, uh, one of the victims of Jeffrey Epstein. Um, so we've got a lot of really great stories and people that are coming to just share their insight. Um, uh, we're releasing June 12th and then our first episode's dropping on July 11th. Hey, Kim, let me so ask you this, I'm, I'm Kim. really excited. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you, I'm going to ask you of a favor. It's obviously your podcast. You do whatever you want, but I, I am requesting, uh, maybe at some point read out, reach out to the family of a police officer. You know, because it is, you know, there, there's officers, obviously a police officer gets killed in the line of duty and there's a, a small blurb about it, but a police officer kills somebody even totally justified. It's a big national story oftentimes. Yeah. And the police officers' families have to go through those things. You know, we had a, an officer that was shot and killed here two years ago, um, you know, here in Tulsa, just a horrible situation. And, you know, just the family, she had two little boys and stuff like that. And I'm just, I'm not saying particularly her, just a story about a police officer and what their family goes through. Uh, you know, because it does, it gets forgotten very quickly because yeah. a lot of people out there just think, oh, it's a police officer's job. He's that's OK. It's it's supposed to happen or it does happen. It's just p- part of it. No, I'm, you know, I'm you really said- glad you, you I'm, I just want just to that point really quickly. I really I a part of it's on my list. We actually have someone, um, one of the Capitol Police from the insurrection that was important to me, too. Um, yep. But the point is, is I think it's interesting to to kind of redefine what a victim and survivor is. And it isn't just what the media tells us it is. And so the hope exactly. of the show is to really kind of broaden people's minds um, and just to be more compassionate and sensitive um, that it doesn't always look the way we think it does. So um, I'm glad that you're bringing that up. I'm super, super pro you know law enforcement so it's always important to me to make sure that i share that side of story so thank you well there's two things that i i've got one of them i think the thing that you said right then was you looking to sensitize people and we've got all these people who have been desensitized you know all the shit comes at us so fast you know it's it's like snow on a windshield you just you can't see all of it you know it's just like it gets lost in there so yeah I, big big kudos for sensitizing people of course but the other thing is is that i want to get your opinion what what do you think of this recent media circus that we had that was with uh mr depp mrs hurt oh you know i really struggled um 
I really struggle because I am obviously super sensitive to issues around domestic violence. Um, and watching what went on between the two of them was heartbreaking. Um, you know, watching two people in such a toxic relationship, um, and be so viscerally angry and violent towards each other, whether it's just psychological, emotional, or physical, um, it was really hard. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that we were having that conversation, but my gosh, the way that that went down and the people against Amber, against team Johnny, team Amber, like how did we get to this place that we're starting to question whether or not someone's experience was that bad or whether or not it ruined your career? I mean, these are two people that, that destroyed each other. And I just, I'm glad we're having the conversation. I wish it was in a healthier way that it wasn't so exploitive um, because I think it can set um, domestic violence victims back, whether they're men victims or women. Um, I think that this is one of those things that says, well, why am I going to bother to share my story because this is what I'm going to get. Um, so right. um, I wish we just had healthier dialogue around it is what I would I would say to that. And well, coo yeah. Cooler heads. Yeah, very much yeah. so. Well, just my advice to that is, get out of the relationship. You know what I mean? If yeah. you've got the problems, like you said, the problems that went on there for years and years. And again, whether she was a victim of domestic violence or he was the victim of domestic violence or both of them, or whatever, whether it's counseling or just get the hell away from one another, you guys, you know, there, there's other people you can be with out there. Cause that's just horrible. This is well, true. I, I want to say, and I know you're going to, I know we probably have to go soon, but Sean, I just, I want to say something, having all the work that I've done with victims and survivors, especially with domestic violence, um, they always say it's not that hard, right? Whether it's a male or woman, but obviously predominantly it's women that are in these situations. They're being controlled, their money's being controlled, they're being threatened with their safety of their children, their family, their livelihood. Um, right. And it, it's not that easy to just get out, um, but... I will say if we had a better support system as a country, if we were more compassionate as a society, if we were more encouraging and and more of a safety valve for people, I think it might lend itself to being a wee bit easier. But I don't think we truly understand how hard, um, you know, folks are manipulated in those situations that it just isn't it just isn't that easy, um, especially when you got a gun to your head, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. so well, you hit the word. I think the word right there is manipulation. Right. You get it yeah. right on there. That's that's a, that's the big problem in a lot of these. Yeah. Well, Kim Goldman, thank you so much for your time on here. It's been a pleasure. Congratulations you, on your engagement. So, did, and by the way, San Francisco was that the Dons? Am I right? Was that the, the or is that uh, San Francisco State? Was that the, the San Francisco State Dons? Wasn't that their mascot? Or was, um, or was that? There's no, one well, of them up uh, there. That's the Dons. No Delta Dons. I, no, it was oh, just we the, were the Dons. The, the they, Gators? No. I, and that's Florida. Green. I don't remember was, what I was. It was, it I don't was remember. green. I remember that. Yeah. I mean, well, congratulations. I know you guys got, uh, Sean, your show with Dan Abrams got picked up. Um, it, Dan's, it Dan's a good friend of mine. So I was, I was happy to hear that. Um, I'm proud of you guys. Um, so Thank I know you. it changed networks and all that. And, but I'm happy to see you're back on the air. We, yeah, are, we are very, too. very excited. So, and yeah. I kind of joke about it. So is my bank account. So. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure having you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. My drink, I don't know what happened. I'll drink the water and cheers you another right. time. Fire okay. them. Mar marry them, but fire them. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, thanks again. Take care. Bye.